Ciao ragazzi! This is Katie Portanova, and you're listening to Florence and Me. I'm a lover of stories and all things Italian, and I'm going to bring you all that in this podcast. My intention is to inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and explore life and travel the world. Join me as I tell you my story and many others about Italy and my love, Florence. Andiamo! Ciao! It is episode 9. And this one I thought I'd take a pause on some of my stories and talk about some of the things that I picked up on when I lived in Florence, when I lived abroad. Um, Some um, habits, some uh, words that I would always say, things I would do when I met friends, like these things that when I was you know, living in the States, I, it would not be something you would do. For example, kissing your friends every time you see them and every time you leave them. Um, that was, it, it was comfortable because I knew it was a custom when I first started doing it, but it was also really awkward because when I first started doing it, I didn't know if this attractive Italian man was leaning in for an actual kiss. (laughs) So there were some times that Katie caught herself going, oh, wait, oh, yeah, this is what we do. (laughs) This is what we do. You kiss me on the one cheek and then the other cheek. I get it. Um, But I'll I'll go into that shortly. Um, The one thing that I thought was a very, like, a custom that maybe it might not even be a custom. It's just something you do when you walk into a store in Italy. Um, Is you say buongiorno. They usually say salve, which is, like, the formal version of ciao of hi and they would just leave you be unless it was a small store sometimes they'd talk to you and ask you if you're looking for something specific just very um being being in Florence like they were always welcoming tourists so like if it was a a store near my house they wouldn't probably do that as much because where I lived was a little bit outside of the center where tourists would be so I didn't really get that type of treatment, like them asking me what I need and stuff. But sometimes they did. If they recognized me, um, they may might have asked, like, what am I looking for? Can they help me? Um, and usually they always did. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a guy that I met in my later years of living in Florence. His name is Alessandro. And Alessandro owned this shop of, like, knickknacks that... I want to say knickknacks, but very cute, like, knickknacky things, <laughs> okay? Like, you know, statues and and things you would see in your grandmother's case at home. Like the willow tree angels, if you guys know. Like precious moments type stuff. Those of you that I'm dating myself here, but it doesn't matter. Um, but he also sold Yankee candles, okay? When I found out he sold Yankee candles and I was obsessed with like making sure like our house smelled good because of the dust and the and the exhaust that right right near Stefano's kitchen window there was there was always a car parked there so you could always smell like exhaust and like gas and yeah so it was always like something that was like oh my god this is home like something of home I wanted to buy a candle so I remember meeting Alessandro and he was like so excited because he's like, oh my God, uh, Yankee Candle's American. And I, you know, he has them shipped over. He only gets certain types. Anyway, long story short, like every time I would pass by there on my way to an um, an English lesson, I would buy a candle <laughs> almost every time. Because one, I, I enjoyed talking to him. He was very personable, asked me about my family, asked me about stuff. And like, we just became friends. And years later... When we finally came back the first time to Italy, um, he had asked me if he could ship some candles to my house that I could fit in my bag so he could sell them. And I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, that's totally illegal. You shouldn't do that. But it wasn't like a lot. It was like small amounts of votives and stuff like that. Anyway, but these are the people that I met. Like, you know, I became close to them and friendships and like it just was great. And Alessandro is one of those people Um, that I was happy to help, you know. Um, Another shop owner 
that I will never, ever forget. Okay, guys, this story is something that would never happen in the States or probably elsewhere. I don't know. Eugenie, no, Eugenio. Eugenio? Yeah, Eugenio. Yeah, that's his name. Eugenio. Sorry, because I had another Eugenio. Another guy. Sorry. <laughs> Sidetrack. Another story I'll tell you in a second. Eugenio worked and owned um, this shoe store right on the strip. Well, you shouldn't say strip. Whatever. Via Martelli. Via Martelli is the street that goes right into the Duomo. And years before, that's where the buses would all pass. Now it's like all pedestrian. Thank God. It's like so much better. It doesn't hurt the, the churches and the architecture and all that stuff. Anyway, Via Martelli had this shoe store where I come to find out later when I met Stefano, his aunt, this is how small Italy is. I mean, Florence is. His aunt worked at that store. So he knew what I was talking about. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Our stars align. <laughs> we, love, we know the same shoe store. I don't know. It was funny. Anyway, Eugenio, when I met him, he was he sold Mephisto sandals, boots, shoes. It's really nice. Oh, just everything amazing. And I needed really supportive shoes. I walked everywhere. My feet hurt all the time. Even when I rode my bike, my feet hurt. I would just, I needed supported shoes. And you all know your feet, you only have two and you can't get new ones. Okay. You got to support your feet. So I was addicted to his store because he had the most, the adorable sandals that would last me forever. I still have some. Okay, guys, it's 10, almost 10 years later, I had bought these, well, more than 10 years, it seems like. I probably should throw them away, but they still work. I love them. And Mephisto in the States is really expensive, and it was expensive in Italy, but like, okay, this is the story. <laughs> Every time I would go in there, I'd be like, okay, Eugenio, I need this shoe. And he'd show me all these different shoes, because he wanted me to make sure I liked them, and I really liked them. And he was so nice. He called me Chicagese, as a lot of guys did, like a lot of store shop owners did I love that Chicago from Chicago and there was this one time I really loved these boots and I still have these boots I still have both of the boots that I bought from him again probably should get rid of them but they still work I love them um so I got these I, I tried on these two sets of boots and I'm like oh my god I love these boots these are so sexy these are so cute oh my god I love them love them love them and I'm like, Eugenio, I don't have enough cash to pay you for both. Let me just buy this one. And he's like, and he's like, oh my God, just take them. I'm like, what? <laughs> take them both and come back and pay me when you're, when you have the money. I'm like, Eugenio, how? I like cried because one of the shoes I needed to walk. Okay. Like my sandals and like comfy, like um, tennis shoes. Like I needed to walk with these shoes the other one was just like okay I can buy these boots another time it's fine and I cried I cried it's ridiculous but like I didn't have a lot of money guys like I had enough money and I always paid in cash I never used my debit card unless I was taking money out everybody paid in cash at that time and I'm not sure if they still do it now um but everybody paid in cash so I'm like Eugenio, how could you be so kind <laughs> to do this? I mean, but he looked at me. He's like, I see you. He said something to the effect, I see you as a good soul. And I know you're going to come back and pay me. And I'm like, oh, my fucking God, I will. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I didn't say that. But I'm like, oh, my God, yes, I will. I'm going to come pay you. I literally came back right when I had my paycheck. I came right back and paid him. Or I think I even paid him the next day because I felt like so guilty that he gave me these other boots for free, technically, at the time. I could have never came back. But no, I came back. He did this a couple other times. Okay, Eugenio is one of those guys, one of those salespeople that that uh, he, he knows how much you need shoes. <laughs> one. Two, he knows that it's hard to live in that city if you are just making ends meet, which I'm sure he met a lot of those people, especially Italians, because there were a lot of Italians that were in the store with me. It wasn't a touristy shoe store, um, as though tourists would walk in, but mostly Italians were in there with me. So it was quite famous. 
Um, years pass, and, and, and he was bought out by Mephisto. So now at that corner, at Via Martelli and, um, uh, I'm not going to remember the cross street. Anyway, you can't miss it. It's a big Mephisto sign. That's where his shop was. And it's actually right down the street to where now is Italy, which is ridiculous. But Italy is in Italy. And those of you that know what Italy is, in Chicago, there's this huge pavilion, like three-story store of Italy, which is like all things Italian, wine, cheese, uh, meat, a restaurant, um, Nutella bar, like all the stuff. So it's just kind of ridiculous that it's there. But because we're in Italy and why would you go there if you're in Italy and you're going to buy wine from that store and not somewhere else? Overpriced, totally overpriced. Anyway, um, so yeah, Eugenio, though, if he's still open, God, dear God, I hope he's still open. Um, he's on Via Proconsolo. I'm totally saying that wrong. Proconsolo. Yeah. Proconsolo. And his, sto- his shop is, is just Eugenio. Eugenio shoes, Eugenio something. And I walked in there in 2017 when I came back for the lo- for the first time since moving away. He looked at me and he's like, Chica Gaze, where have you been? And I'm like, I like almost cried. I'm like, I moved back. And he's like, oh, I was wondering where you were. And oh, I'm a... he's like, do you need any shoes? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm here with my husband. And so we met Stefano and like, oh, my God. And he, he said that it was really hard and, like, just told me his whole story and why he moved there. And, like, but he's good. He works with his son and, like, but he's he's such a, a salesman and he's such a people person that I know I really, speriamo, speriamo, I really hope that he's still there because he is amazing. And he spoke a little, he understood English, he didn't speak it, but he probably speaks it now, maybe. I don't know. But... I I was really I loved him. Anyway, that's the story of Eugenio and his shoes. Is my favorite story because I talk about I whenever I think of those shoes, I think of him and I think of him giving me free shoes and me paying him back, obviously. But very, very an amazing man. These are the people that I met when I lived there. Um and so San Buongiorno was what where I was leading to. San Buongiorno when you come in and people asking you, yeah. And then leaving, when you leave, I would always say grazie. Grazie. Thank you for offering me your beautiful shop, even if I didn't buy anything. But thank you for being of service and being there. And in in the in the states you don't you don't nobody does that. Nobody says, I mean, yeah, they say hey maybe, but they never say, you know, thanks as they leave. But Italians were always very, like, grateful that you even said thanks and not just leave. I don't know. It was a weird, I felt, I felt a really, not a weird, like um, a good energy exchange with people when I would come in, give a smile, buongiorno, ah, buongiorno, come va, no, no, no. And then when I left and I said, hey, grazie, grazie, buona giornata, you know, it just was like, I appreciate you. You appreciate me as a consumer. And it's just that in exchange. I I miss that. I miss that. Um, and I miss the way I used to walk into stores and just kind of like mosey browse and not really have anything in mind necessarily. But recently, let's see, it was 2019 when my sister got married I was walking around Florence by myself waiting for Stefano and I was waiting for a friend, I think. And I went into this tea shop that I used to go to with my friend Lexi um, near um, Palazzo Pitti. And it's like right on the edge of the square of Palazzo Pitti. And it, these two ladies that work there are just like fantabulous. Like they're just sweethearts. And they still remember me. Fuck. Like I walked in and she's like, Lexi's friend I'm like yeah Katie she's like yes you like all of our stuff on Facebook like I still follow them they're just amazing ladies they have so much knowledge about tea at the time I was having um I believe this was after Emmy's wedding and I had a really I had really bad bronchitis and I had gotten of course this is June it's horrible to be sick when it's summer and I told them my like symptoms and stuff and she's like oh my god this is the tea for you and I bought it and I'm like like that type of customer service, I like wasn't in the market for tea. I still have the tea, 
But I was just like, oh, my God, I love her. <laughs> and they're just gorgeous women. They were just fabulous. Oh, my God. Fantabulous. I like the word fantabulous. Um, so, yeah, like just going in there and be like, hey, you remember like they remember me, guys. I mean, Florence is not that big, but like when you live there for as long as I did and you go to the same shops, people remember your face. And I think that's where I get the fact that I don't remember people's names and I remember people's faces. And that's my Italian in me. <laughs> so I believe that. There's another shop. Um, well, the shop of the name of that shop, if you want to go there, is Oro Nero, Oro Nero, um, Te or something like that. And it's right, you can't miss it if you're looking at, from, if you're standing at the door of the Palazzo Pitti, you look, you, you're going to go towards your, um, your left. And it's right at the edge of the piazza. There's a probably, I think there's like a bancomat or like a, a gelateria like next to it. I can't remember. Oh my God, go to it. They are fabulous. And they speak English and they're, they're very, 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 very sweet, very sweet ladies I'm trying to give them business. Um, and then... In that same area, down the street, I, if she's still in that same... I, I don't know. She might have moved, but I'll tell you about her. Maria Pace is um, is her name. And she makes these amazing clothes. I have bought probably maybe three dresses from her. Um, a skirt. I don't know. A belt. I bought, I bought a few things from her. And the last time I went there, I spent like, like I think, $300. But I just wanted to give back to her. She's very talented, very sweet, very, um, I love her style. So look up Maria pa Pache, um, Pache, and it's spelled, okay, Maria, P-A-C-E. And look her up. She's on Facebook. She's on Instagram. She's fabulous. If you ever are in Florence and you want a real designy, designer type clothes and you don't have to spend like Gucci type money, go to her because she's fabulous and she's will tell you the truth because <laughs> I told her do I look ridiculous in your dress that's fabulous <laughs> and she's like no 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 you look great um so yeah I still have some of her dresses and she's she's great she's another one that I got to know and when I do go in there she does remember me um and she's very sweet very very sweet um so I'm trying to think of all the other shops I know <laughs> so well, these these two shops that I'm talking, I'm going to talk about next, or these two restaurant type places, um, they don't exist anymore. One of them has a new owner. Actually, both of them have new owners. I, I think they're still called the same thing. Um, when I was, it was probably my second year, probably 2010 is when I found Luca and Leo. Luca and Leo had this um, panino shop right near Pocciolino, um, the the market, and it was on a little tiny side street, and. Um, Oh my God, I spent evenings there with them, just evenings, even when they closed up, like I helped them cl not clean up, but I would sit there and drink wine and just have little chit chats with them. And they're, they were, um, brother and brothers in law. Um, and they were just great. I got to know, I got to understand a lot more, um, dialect because of them. And because of the men and the women that would come in the store shop owners, they would come and get a panino and they go back to work and, I heard just a lot of amazing grammar and amazing conversations about politics, about just awesome things. Like, and I remember a specific time. Now, you guys that get starstruck, you might be like, what the hell? Why didn't you go around the corner? Um, I was sitting at Luca and Leo's and some guy comes up and says, hey, um, in Italian, hey, 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 George Clooney, l'altra la, la strada, he's in the other street. George Clooney, he was walking around, just shopping. And people were like, oh my God, George Clooney. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be that person. No, but no. So I didn't. I didn't see him. I did, however, see in one of, in Porcelino Market, I did, however, see Richard Simmons. If anybody out there knows who Richard Simmons is, he was like a workout star celebrity back in the 90s 80s or something always wore shorts and he he sounded exactly the same I just heard him talk to some lady like you're fabulous or something that was all the other star I saw and um did I see who else did I see I didn't see Jersey Shore was there when I was there <laughs> 
I saw them a few times, and it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. There was, like, American students, like, chasing them, and it was dumb. Yeah, all Italian, all Italians hated them. And there are a lot of newspaper articles about them. Obviously, they're not, like, <laughs> the crim of the crop. But, um, but that was kind of cool, I guess, to see them walking around Florence looking, like, greased up weird people. I don't know. Um, so I went from Luca and Leo. Okay, so Luca and Leo were gentlemen that really were, like, kind of, like, my, like, cheers, can I say? Like, you know, when Norm walks in, like, I literally would walk around the corner, hey, Kate, ciao, bella, ciao, like, really... I felt like I belonged and I felt like I could just sit there all night, sit there all afternoon until I had my next lesson. Like I had my bike parked nearby. Like, and when I wasn't with, when I didn't, this was before Stefano. So like I could go home whenever I wanted. And usually they closed around seven um, because they're open like all, all day, like from like 10 to seven or something like that. Like, yeah, I would get like a sandwich to go and like that would be my dinner. And, like, come home, take my time, ride my bike, and, you know, it was fun. It was really fun. And the other place that I was going to tell you about um, was called Pangis. Now, Pangis was owned by this family, Cortini, Francesca, Laura was the other sister, Francesca and Laura are sisters, and Mario and uh, Antonella, I believe is the mother's name. So they went into business as a family, and and ran this place oh my god it was the cutest place it's still there it's just under new management um I ended up because I got to know them so well like I ended up giving Mario English lessons (laughs) it didn't go like as well he was one of those like old school Italian like it was hard it's like my father-in-law my father-in-law tried to learn English but it went in one ear out the other and kind of like Stefano, but Stefano communicates enough. So, but his dad had trouble and so did Mario. Mario was, <laughs> he was so funny. I enjoyed having my salads there. They had delicious salads. Francesca made these amazing salads. Um, And that was another place that I felt really comfortable just going in there whenever and having a glass of wine and then maybe have an anti- antipasto, but my other friend Laura and I found it. We went there for dinner one night and we just fell in love with it. And we talked to the girls there and like they were just like, Ooh. we just became friends immediately, guys. Like it was just great. And when you find those places in a, in a, in a foreign city, you're just like, oh, my God, I fucking belong. Like these are amazing people. And I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful that I had had happened upon this or that Laura took me to it and like it's just it was just made my whole experience there for four years four and a half years and even longer like I've been there for so many times it made it so special and that's how Joshua Tree you know became my place I just had places I knew I could go and I would be comfortable there and I don't I'm not gonna be harassed by weirdos like you know I mean because women do get like cat called in Italy if you haven't been there yeah be prepared um but usually those aren't Italians I'll be honest they're sometimes they're Italians but sometimes they're Moroccan or Albanian but again not that there's anything wrong with that but I'm just saying not all Italians are cat calling you and like I think I told you in the first episode maybe I didn't because I didn't really talk about well no I talked about school when we would go to clubs and stuff, which I don't think, no, I don't think I told you guys this, the first episode, when we would go to like Space Electronic or Andromeda, which doesn't exist anymore, um, like there were guys that spoke Italian there, but we come to find out that, you know, and we need to realize, open your freaking eyes, Katie, they were not Italian. They were Moroccan, most of them, and Albanian. Again, nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying, like, that when when you're a tourist or when you're a student, if any students, study abroad students, are listening to this before they go abroad, whenever they can, just be aware when you're in Italy, just because they speak Italian does not mean they're Italian. So if you have a bad experience with somebody that spoke Italian, 
odds are that they're probably not Italian of d- Italian descent. They just live there. They've lived there so long that they sound Italian. And when you are a tourist and when you are a student, you don't know the difference. You can't hear the accent. When I lived there, I heard the accent. I could see, you know, it, 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 how they looked. I could tell if they were Moroccan, Albanian, um, uh, Egyptian, uh, Syrian. Like they, they all have similar looks that you could assume that they're Italian, but they're not. And again, I'm not saying that any of those races, any of those ethnicities are, um, are violent or are, um, aggressive, but some of them are, (laughs) some of the men are. And that is like for a while, like after I was, when I was living there too, but after, um, I left and I wasn't a student anymore, I remember hearing stories about, you know, American girls getting attacked by or getting raped by, you know, uh, Moroccans or Albanians or whatever when they're in the club and they're maybe doing drugs and like whatever. Again, not their fault as women, but just watch who you're with. Be aware of the people around you and just don't let get your own drinks. <laughs> get your girlfriends to get you drinks or your guy friends or whatever. But just a little disclaimer because it is, it can be a scary place if you don't know. If you're not confident enough to know that, if you're not confident, I'll just say that. If you're not confident and you're not aware, be aware, be aware of your surroundings. Um, okay, so those are those are some of the places. Um, I'll talk about Joshua Tree another time. Um, I've talked about it a lot, so it's okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll talk about it again. Um, the other thing that I picked up on, and I, t- I, I alluded to this at the beginning, is um, the um, the initial, sorry, what is the word? Salutare. When you, when you say hi to somebody, your friends or family or, yeah, it, it, the kissing of the cheeks. Okay. So it's usually, I think it's right then left or left then right. I think it's right. You go to their right. I don't know. Anyway, this was like foreign to me when I was a student. And the guys I was students, like my other students, uh, the other guys that studied with me at study abroad, they were totally against it, obviously, because they're men and they're like, oh, masculine. We don't do that. Blah, 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 whatever. I, on the other hand, like I said at the beginning, I didn't understand (laughs) at first that that was a custom or that was something you did to say hello and say goodbye. And usually for guys, and I'll be specific because not all guys are kissing their guy friends on the cheeks. They're kind of going cheek to cheek. And, but there are some guys that, you know, give not like wet kisses or like, yeah, that's not sloppery, but you know, it's just a, it's just a gesture of like, okay, hi, how are you doing? But yeah. And, and the same thing with girls, like, I'll be honest. So my friend Simone, like when he would kiss me hello and goodbye, like it wasn't really a kiss. It was more like a cheek to cheek. So I think I should just stop saying kissing because it really is a cheek to cheek kind of salutation instead of a kiss. Yeah. But that became like the norm. Well, that is the norm, obviously, if you live there. So I I remember coming back and I remember being like, like I was missing something. When I moved back in 2013, like I was missing out on that interaction. Like something was wrong if I didn't kiss somebody hello and goodbye. It was wrong. And I couldn't understand. I couldn't put my finger on it until I realized I'm like, oh, that's right. You guys don't do that. <laughs> it's not comfortable. It's not except it's not it's not a norm. And God, I freaking miss that. I miss that connection with somebody else. And it's not just like being with Stefano. Like, obviously, it's different when you're with a partner. But like, I miss that. I felt like my friends, my friendships were a lot stronger and meaningful because of that. Is that weird? Is that weird to say? I don't know. Because obviously now with the pandemic, you know, nobody's kissing anybody or holding hands at all. But or shaking hands, but I, 
I truly hope that that custom isn't lost when everything is is safe. Let's put it that way, safe. I'm not going to say normal. I miss it. I miss it a lot. And um, yeah. Um, and the other, the next thing I'll talk about. So I was, I mentioned this before, I was a, a big tomboy. Like when I was growing up, I played on um, a co-ed soccer team for many years. And I had a lot of guy friends, a lot of guy friends. And I think the reason why I had guy friends is because they're just easier. They, uh, there wasn't always, there wasn't cattiness. There wasn't petty bullshit of like, I don't know what girls do. And as I've, as I've grown up and as I've moved through my thirties, like I know that friendships with women are touchy sometimes, but when you curate them and communicate with them, it's, it, it becomes a very, um, special relationship, I guess, you know, when you have girlfriends that you can trust after, you know, so many years. I have some girlfriends that I've been friends with for over 20 years and it's great. Um, But yeah, I, um, so anyway, I had a lot of guy friends and I still, you know, when I lived in Italy, I did have a lot of guy friends. (laughs) When I, before I met Stefano, I went out, I, I talked about on an earlier episode about my Fiorentini friends, my Florentine friends, Um, that was basically a group of guys with girlfriends. I'm just going to put it out there. There were, I I met girls through them and not necessarily their girlfriends. They were girl girls as friends that became my friends. But yeah, I, I just was comfortable with them. And, and being in Italy and being a woman, it's really, um, it's to be confident as a woman is strange for men. Meaning, I'm going to say, try to explain this. Because when I was with these guy friends, before Stefano again, these Fiorentini, like, they, they were kind of, I I feel like I was like um, a woman they were studying. (laughs) Because they would ask me a lot of interesting questions about my life and like what I've done and like how I've traveled alone and like they're just they were like kind of in awe by it because Italian women don't usually do that um it's not something in their DNA they especially in the south um you know southern Italian women are kind of more traditional and they get married and they have children and mm, you know it's that type of thing so when I go and talk about me traveling through Europe on a train and then backpacking and going to, an, uh, you know, f- doing paragliding in Switzerland, which was another thing I was going to talk about in another episode, like they just looked at me like I had two heads. Like, what? How did you do that? Why would? So when I was with these guys, I enjoyed that they had all these questions because one, I was American. Two, I had a voice and I was I was wholeheartedly accepted for my voice. And there were a few times that I would go out just with these four guys and we were just like, shoot the shit and like have a beer, you know, go for a drink, go for an aperitivo, meet up with some other friends and then make our way home. And it was nothing sexual. It was nothing like I wasn't, well, I was one into one of the guys on a side note, but in the end, like I was like mostly just being there as a friend and we just had conversations, communications, talked about things. And it was, it was great. And I learned through that relationship, those relationships. And also then when I worked for the Carabinieri and like, I was a confident woman that these men were like flabbergasted by. And also some of them were enticed by, and they would ask me really, you know, interesting questions. And now I can't think of any of them, but just like, Like I said, like, how did you do that? How did you go and travel by yourself? And how did you fly across an ocean by yourself? And, and, uh, I was, I learned how to be confident and be okay with men and be able to say no when I meant no. And I won't go into that. I might go into it another time, but there were some times that Katie got herself into some risky situations, but I was able to say no, and it turned out for the best. 
And um, yeah, so that's why I was saying earlier, women, students, girls, be aware of your surroundings when you are in a foreign country. Do not assume, do not assume anything. Whoever's sitting next to you, whoever's getting you a drink, don't drink it. <laughs> don't assume anything. Um, but yeah, another disclaimer. Okay, so being around men was okay for me. <laughs> Especially good looking Italian men. These were great. Um, great times. Um then I'm gonna talk about my <laughs> my um transportation in Italy, in Florence, mostly in Florence, but in Italy. In Italy, yes, train um using the train is is the most efficient way. If you don't have a car and a lot of people don't have cars, they have motorinis, they have scooters, they have motorcycles that are easy to park. Again, easy to park is very important. I learned this as I became more friends with uh, friends with people with cars, like finding somewhere to park is always uh, just a horrible headache in Florence. So my transportation was mostly if I had to go outside of, of Florence was train. And the trains are very efficient, very, um, not always on time, but they do their job and it's good. Um, but when I was in Florence, I had my beautiful yellow bike and I talked about this, um, in another episode, my beautiful yellow California bike, it said California on it because it was from California and I had an adorable basket, um, a very comfy seat, gear changes. I had a little bell. It was beautiful. Oh, my yellow bike. I think I called her Sole, my sunshine. She was beautiful. My bike was my car. And what does that mean? That means I had two chains, very heavy duty chains, because stealing bikes is a job in Florence and in a lot of Italian cities. <laughs> and then they sell them, you know, and my bike was gorgeous. So it was, it, it was, I saw a few times people trying to steal it. Um, like trying to saw through my, um, my chain, but they didn't get it for four and a half years. My bike was my bike and I, <laughs> I never lost it. I took care of it. I took it to my mechanic who did, um, gave me new brakes when my brakes went. It was basic. It was literally taking care of a car, a very tiny car and a very, very, um, use, uh, like useful car because, <laughs> I, uh, I used the bike because one, I didn't want to pay for bus tickets, bus tickets at the time. And I know it's probably gone up, but bus tickets at that time for a one, one, one ride for 90 minutes. So like if you get off and then get back on within 90 minutes of the time that's stamped, it, you know, it's valid was a, was a euro 50. Okay. Now that's, you're like telling me like Katie, oh my God, that's nothing. No. When you're working ten dollars an hour, ten euro an hour, and not making a lot of money and all my expenses, no, it, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of money. So my bike was my godsend, and like it took me everywhere, especially when there were bike paths on the viales, like through Piazza uh, Libertà, Piazza Beccaria, Piazza Donatello. Like it's just a smooth ride all the way to the Arno. It's just like freaking awesome. Like wind in my hair. Uh, it was god. It was just awesome. the The times that were kind of, you know, not too <laughs> easy was when I would have to ride my bike on the cobblestones. Now, the cobblestones, and uh, and again, anyone that's lived in Florence or been into Florence, the cobblestones, especially if buses run over them, they get wobbly. There could be huge potholes, which I wouldn't call them potholes, but just missing a cobblestone. And there were times that I got my bike stuck in one of those, like, boom, like, oh, that pain, pain all down my back, all up my leg. Oh, my God. So it is tre treacherous when you have a bike sometimes because you have to avoid those those um, holes in the road and also traffic, man. Whew. Like some of those roads that I would go down. They're narrow, okay? Very narrow. And especially if there's a tiny little sea bus. Beep, beep, beep. They make that noise because they are electric. <laughs> um, behind you. 
So there are times I had to get off my bike and lean up against the wall to let the car or the bike or the um, the bus to go by. Um, and then when I was living with Stefano, when I started living with Stefano, riding my bike from um, Viale de Mille to his house probably was a good 30 to 40 minute bike ride. And that's, that's long. And even that, that's me cutting like shortcuts and stuff like that. Like it was long. And, and when I got towards his house, the road was more for cars and not so much for bikes. So there were a few times, guys, I was literally right. Like buses and cars in Italy do not make space for bikers and walkers on the road. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is like, you know, here in the States, we make that you circle around the bicyclists around um the person that's walking on the road no 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 this huge bus is right next to me i could literally touch the bus going like 35 40 miles an hour Whoom. like it's fucking scary it was it was scary towards the end of my four and a half years there i didn't want to ride my bike anymore like i was scared for my life <laughs> just because of where we lived i i didn't live in the center anymore or near, near the nearest to the center where there were bike paths and stuff like that so it's scary it's scary but um as the years went on when i was a nanny in 2007 and then to when i was um living there i got really comfortable with the city traffic in the center and the people traffic oh fuck the people traffic <laughs> Trying to get to Piazza della Signoria from the Duomo was like freaking, uh, it was like uh, uh, one of those like um, video games, like trying to weave in and out of the people. Oh my God. At a certain point, you just give up and you walk your bike <laughs> to the next destination because it's just like when it's that crowded, it's just crazy. So yeah, so that's my bike. Like my bike was my was my place and and my... My other mode of transportation, like I said, was my was the bus. And then as the years went on towards 2012, 2013, like I kind of stopped riding my bike as much just because I didn't really, I just didn't really, I, I, I wanted to ride my bike so bad, but just getting it to the center just took forever. Like it took me a good 20, 30 minutes to get to the center from Stefano's house. So I, I started taking the bus and I took 57, number 57 bus back to the center, back to the station and um and I, then I walked everywhere, you know, to get to one appointment, one one lesson to the next, and and yeah, my bus was like, I knew the buses so freaking well too. Oh my god, I knew where what bus went where, what time. I had an app for it, so like I couldn't you know see if the fifty seven was there. Like it was getting a lot of um more technology. They were getting more tech savvy, um regarding the bus system and regarding like buying tickets every like I was buying tickets through my through an SMS through a text message so it was like it was awesome by the time I left because I knew everything I knew where number six went I knew where number eight went where I mean I just all of that and Stefano would like look at me going like how do you know all this like because I have to know where these buses go in case I get stuck you know I know I can take number eight to San Marco to pick up this this number to go to this place like I was freaking the queen of buses. Like all my friends would ask me like, which bus is this? I'm like, okay, we'll take this bus here to get to this piazza, to this piazza. I I pride myself on that. And even to this day, if I can think back hard enough, and if they didn't change the bus schedules, <laughs> I could probably tell you exactly where all the buses went um, and still go, to be honest, because um, I've taken them all. <laughs> I've taken every single number, I think, that go through the center, around the center and stuff. So, um, and, um, the, I've last two things I'm going to talk about. This one's going a little long today, but, um, the one thing I really miss, I really, really miss about living in Florence is the fact that time kind of stood still whenever you are with somebody or having a meal or taking a walk like i don't remember rushing a lot at all like yeah to get to my lessons and stuff like that but even then like 
a lot of my students were always late. <laughs> like, I mean, I, 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 I do pride myself on being punctual and being on time, but there were certain times that I was waiting around for my students, but I was okay with that because they're Italian and time is, is just a guideline as a suggestion <laughs> to be someplace. But, um, with, with this no rushing thing and and the one person that I felt complete and utter presence with was one of my is one of my best friends Pasquale and I I haven't I talked a little bit about him I think last episode um about the number eight he is one of those people that makes you think but also makes you just sit in the presence of being human. He posed questions to me that made me think and made me kind of rush to answer. And he's like, no, 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 take your time. Think about it. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> I don't have to tell you right now. And with him, I had a lot of adventures with him. And it was basically just living and being present and not looking at a phone, not looking at a screen. Like we were in nature. We went to this, uh, he, we call it the Fiume, the, the river in Ferenzuola, north of the center, north of Florence. And there was this natural river that people would go to in the summer especially if you couldn't get to the seaside and and it was just like I feel like it was just like a river or like a hot spring not a hot spring like a I don't know just something it was natural it wasn't something man-made but it was it was it was awesome it was um we'd like pack a lunch we go take a, it was like an, maybe an hour and a half drive north. He would borrow his brother's car and we just talk and have like, you know, real conversations. And I'd, I'd always, of course, be talking about a guy I was interested in. I always remember doing that. And him never judging me. He never judged me. I never said, Katie, will you stop fucking talking about guys and blah, blah, blah. No. He would he would listen and he would be present and he would always pose other questions. <laughs> he never would answer me directly. And um he just gave me things to think about. And he was very he's very animated and he's very he's just very special. I could cry because I haven't seen him in so long. But he's well. He's still good. He, he's he's actually right now he's in Basilicata where he's from and taking care of his parents during the pandemic. His parents are still alive. Yes. I'm not going to tell you how old he is, but he's definitely in his 50s. <laughs> but I don't even remember how old he is. But And then the last thing I'll talk about is I didn't get a smartphone until I think 2012 is when Stefano and I, <laughs> I kind of coerced him to get the 4S. Um when I was dating him and um and I miss that I miss having a flip phone I'll be honest I am very addicted to my phone as most of you are do not lie and I miss not having to keep looking at my phone I miss just checking my email when I get home <laughs> or even checking Facebook at the time I still had Facebook like you know I still had I had Facebook um or checking anything when you got home and your phone was a phone to text or call. That's it. I'm I'm grateful that I lived through a time without a smartphone. I'm so grateful. Because it allowed me to live and it allowed me to be present with the people around me. Because I wasn't addicted to looking at my phone. Even when I would get text messages... My phone was always on vibrate and it still is to this day. <laughs> um, I now have an Apple watch and I kind of regret it only because I don't really want to know things. But anyway, but I think my, 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 my conclusion of this episode is 
is that we need to be more present. And what I learned by living abroad and and being with these people that became my friends, like if you're not present, you're not living. You're just on autopilot. And I'm grateful that I met friends like that. And I'm grateful that I met friends that appreciated being human and appreciated being present and doing things in the moment and actually having fucking conversations and not being drawn to your phone because your husband's calling or your boyfriend's calling or, you know, or you got a, an alert for a work email. I don't know. Just whatever it might be. Like, I'm just so grateful. Because as I age now, um, I just turned 40. It feels the same. (laughs) I am going to strive to be more present with people around me in my life and trying to move away from having that phone near me all the time. And I've been desperately trying to do that for probably two and a half years. And I I get on a kick on it and then I stop and then, you know, it's just, it's a work in progress. And I, and I'm going to be compassionate towards myself and be like, Katie, you're doing good. You're doing what you can. And yeah, that's it. So just take today and let's learn to be present. Be present with your children, with your with your parents, with your grandparents, with your colleagues. Um, put your phone down. And just understand that this moment right now, that's it. It's gone. You know, enjoy the time that you have. Because like I told my friends who asked me, like, how does it feel? You're 40. I'm like, I am grateful. I'm alive. Punto basta. Like, a lot of people don't live to this age. (laughs) A lot of people aren't aware that they're this lucky to be this age. You know, fuck trying to look young. Fuck trying to get a six-pack or look amazing in a bathing suit. Fuck it. No. You are here for a reason. To do something, Katie. That's it. Punta basta. And that's why I created Truly Italy. Because this life is all we have. This moment is all we have. We don't know what's going to happen the next moment. And um, yeah, so Truly Italy, I foresee it being something of service, experience, adventure. And if you're at all interested in joining me, um, next June uh, at Campo Sevoli, which I'm going to talk about, I believe, in the next episode. Um, I had a few ideas to talk about today, but I'm just like, uh, I couldn't pick just one. So I kind of just put them all together. Um, so if you wanted to join me next June 2022, June 4th through the 11th, DM me at, uh, in, at Instagram, Caterina Fiore, K-A-T-E-R-I-N-A-F-I-O-R-E. And that's Instagram or look up Truly Italy Tours on um, Facebook. I have a Facebook page. Um, Or you can even email me, trulyitalytours at gmail.com. If you're interested, Um, I've got the pricing all down. It's going to cost... because I got nine spots, guys. Nine spots in these cute little apartments. It's going to cost twenty eight fifty nine for um per person. And there's payment plans. There's a deposit of five hundred dollars. Contact me if you if you really want to see Italy with me. Because guys, I've seen it. It's beautiful, and there's so much to see besides the museums and the churches. As much as they're beautiful, there's people, too, that I really would like to introduce you to. And um, and the food and the wine and, you know, all the, all the good stuff. <laughs> all right. Ragazzi. Ci si vede? Until next time. 
A presto. I am beyond grateful for you listening to my podcast right now. I am so excited to share my journey of living abroad and all of my stories of Florence and Italy and all the places in between that I've visited. If this has reached you in any way and you would like to continue, please subscribe now. Also, go check out my website, trulyitaly.tours, for all my travel experiences. Ci si vede. Ciao.